Well, thanks everybody for coming. So I, I view these late afternoon sessions as the people that come here really want to be here. So I appreciate that you're doing that. And hopefully it'll be an entertaining and informative 40 minutes or so. So my name is Scott Perry. I'm the auditor in the room. So I come, you know, I have a different vantage point as it looks at, you know, as I look at blockchain networks. Uh, I look at trust as a key aspect of what blockchain technology brings to the marketplace and the internet. And so, you know, I look at things, you know, a little differently. You know, this is a technology-oriented um, conference, but um, it seems like there's a lot of bantering about with the word trust. And um, we're gonna, in this presentation, we're gonna kind of get into the details of kind of deconstruct what trust really is. And how do you create trust in blockchain networks or the internet itself? And so why do I even have a position on that? Well, just to introduce myself, um, so I, you know, I'm a career IT auditor. Uh, I was around, I'm based in Seattle. Uh, I was around when the internet was kind of forming. I was the external auditor for Microsoft and involved in e-commerce security standards, the creation of certification authorities, and, um, and now I audit certification authorities. So uh, my clients are those that are trust anchors on the internet. Matter of fact, they issue security certificates for about half the internet, and I'm their auditor. So I'm the closest thing to a kind of an internet judge, at least that's what I tell my kids, you know, so they think better about what I do, you know. So I am looking, you know, continuously about unique act aspects of cryptography. And blockchain, you know, came to my attention five years ago before Hyperledger was even around. And so I was around, you know, with the formation of some major players at this conference, Sovereign and CU Ledger, um, and advising them around the education around what does it mean to build trust? And so we're gonna, I'm gonna give you some insights around how you actually, what is trust and how do you create digital trust and what are the aspects of, of blockchain that adds to digital trust? Why does it make it you know, unique? And why, if you're building applications in the marketplace, where would you target? from a trust standpoint, because this adds a certain layer that didn't exist before. And hopefully we'll have you know, enough time to go through all the material and get a chance for any questions, ask the auditor or anything, you know? So you start with, okay, how can we build trust without even knowing what trust is? And if you look, kind of the Merriam-Webster dic you know, dictionary definition of it, it's all, it's all human terms of aspects of how I trust. Usually in a trust situation, you know when you don't trust someone. But you don't, it's, it's odorless, it's colorless. You can't really you know, define necessarily what trust is. Philosophers have tried to do it since Plato. You know? But as a professional that deals with kind of the IT environments, you need to have some mathematic creation to it. And it's a predicted level of Sorry about that. Predicted level of confidence, and that's where we want to get to, okay? So if you look in the marketplace of what, you know, what creates trust, okay? And basically this is more of a humanities slide for a STEM audience, but you need to have these components in order to build trust, okay? You need to have a context. I'm not going to, you know, ask you to, you know, to change my tire. I, maybe I'll ask you to change my tire, but I'm not gonna give you the keys to my house. So there's a context of when I will allow trust, and you have to have that context associated with it. There needs to be perception of risk and vulnerability, and there needs to be a value attached to creating trust, okay? There's, there's a cost and also a benefit value of creating trust. And in order to create trust, we need to have an established reputation. Okay, I issue CPA audit reports based on my, my reputation of doing this in the marketplace and my demonstrated competence in the field. 
So you need to have some of those things. You need to say what you're going to do, do what you say, and do it continuously, and then you build trust attached to that. Now, philosophers talk about there needs to be a foundational optimism associated with trust, and I think we all want that for the internet or the internet 2.0. We all want to be trustworthy, but right now the internet is not as trustworthy as we'd like to be, okay? Because there are underlying motivations for trust and, and, and distrust. Now, as we move to digital trust, one of the key things that I wanted you to take away from this presentation is there's a human component in digital trust. And that's a key, that's, that's one of the biggest frailties around digital trust. They're built by humans, we're, we're prone for failure. And most of the areas where I identify issues associated with, with trustworthiness, it's all, you know, most of them are dealt with the human aspect of it, okay? The internet or, you know, digital networks are a creation of society and it matches it. We didn't replace our society when we created the internet, okay? So there's aspects, even in systems change life cycle. If we have a programmatical uh, component, okay, that works once and it's gonna work tomorrow, but if you don't have a good change management methodology, it's going to break down. And who creates this, a change management methodology? It's humans, okay? And so, Systems have hardware, network failures, and also, as it mirrors society, we're gonna deal with bad actors. It's not really a cybersecurity lecture around all the bad things that can happen in networks, but you know that they exist. So, I wanted to create, at least from a, a, a discussion standpoint, these are foundational principles. Have you all heard of SOC 2s and SOC reports? It's a standard that my profession offers around for third parties to create trust in the marketplace. And the AICPA has created trust principles in different categories, okay? Security, kind of the protection of data, availability is the system's gonna be there when you need them, confidentiality and privacy, or do you have the contracts with your customers to prevent, you know, to protect the confidentiality and the privacy of your constituents, okay? Now, I can tell you in all the work that I've done, the, la the last one, processing integrity, doesn't get touched as much. And that's where blockchain is gonna be a difference maker, okay? So, when I, wa I wanted to put together a slide to show how digital trust gets created, okay? So, there are components in a dig digital trust model. We have on the top, you have a governance authority, and we're starting to talk about it here. They even allowed me to speak at this conference because governance is now even playing a role in that, okay? But governance is going to be absolutely critical as you move forward, okay? We're dealing with all the plumbing, and we're dealing with the protocols and the, the communication venues, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the governance, okay? Where's the governance? You got you know, MasterCard Visa's governance, the CA browser forum that controls all connections around, you know, the security certificates that control traffic on the internet. They're a governance authority. U.S. government that I work with, they, issued, they issue credentials to agencies and they have a governance model. And I have a credential that falls under those protocols. And so each player that wants to play in it and get in blockchain deals with network participants, a collaborative network participants where indiv individual entities have to be accountable for what they're adding into the network. And what they're adding is some of the trust principles dealing with the, you know, within their procedures and operations. And when I audit certification authorities, that's what I get into. I get into their procedures and operations, make sure that they are being accountable to what the requirements are from the governance authority, okay? And the governance authority has set aside trust criteria. They say, we want you to act this way, whether it's an industry or a technology area, they create trust criteria that they want all actors within a network to follow. 
And that's not going to be any different in a blockchain network, okay? And we're going to talk about what role you may play in that blockchain network, and that will depend, that will drive the criteria that you're dealing with. Now, an auditor could take place. I add value. I stake my reputation and my process into adding value because if you're going to say, I do all kinds of things, I don't know if I could trust you, but if Scott says you're okay with doing it, maybe you'll trust it a little bit more. You know, there's always a challenge around that. But in the model that we work with, a trusted third party, an accreditor, or someone that does software testing and all that, usually adds trust into, you know, the components so that the users at the bottom can rely upon it better. Now, if there are bad auditors out there, I can tell you. And so there is auditor accreditation bodies that make sure that auditors are meeting certain standards. So that's how trust is created in networks that, that involve that. Sometimes the auditor's there, sometimes not, okay? So for this presentation, I don't have to go over to the detail, but I'm gonna be giving this presentation to professionals in, in my arena, you know, that don't understand these terms about blockchain networks, and I'll be educating them around what these things mean, but I'm not gonna talk about it, but what I'm gonna say is the aspects of blockchain networks, the key trust components that I see in the marketplace, add these things and they relate to the trust principles that we talked about right here, okay? Directly. Immutability, non-repudiation, Deal with processing integrity. If something, if, if an item is on a blockchain and it's signed, we know this is the aspect of it. We, we know at least the result has some, has some aspect of, of truth associated with it, okay? It is a source of truth. We don't know, maybe it, maybe it could be garbage in, garbage out. But at least when it's on the blockchain, we have, we have some strength and confidence that there is processing integrity once it's sitting in there. And that's a game changer for certain aspects, certain use cases. So zero knowledge proof deals exactly with the privacy aspect. It's like a, it, you know, it's a newfound entity that I found, that I found could be very, very valuable in the marketplace, okay? Because privacy concerns exist and if I don't have to give away all the information needed to deal with a transaction where a, sat where a person can be satisfied by knowing that I'm old enough but not necessarily knowing my, knowing my age, that's, that's a unique aspect that can be used in lots of different use cases. Now, the redundancy and availability, we know that those, are, those, those have been issues with, with networks in the past, but just the aspect of the fact that you know, we have replicatable uh, aspects of a blockchain around a network create that availability, which, is, which could be global. I mean, we're dealing with you know, a sovereign network that have nodes all around the globe, okay? And I deal with the internet you know, aspects where, where there's repeaters around you know, OCSP, which is letting you know if something has a security certificate has been revoked and you need to get an aspect on that. Every time you go to a website, you need to be checking that. And so the availability of those types of networks are needed and blockchain can, needs, you know, will have that if it is dispersed in the correct way. So I attended this conference in Basel, uh, Switzerland in December of 2018 and the keynote speaker was Bruce Schneier. And he's very you know, noted cybersecurity you know, pontificator and such. Um, he was at RSA last week and all that. And he said something that just irked me a bit because he said, categorically, blockchain shifts the trust to, in people and institution to trust in technology. And since I live day to day on all these things, it didn't make sense to me because most of the issues are with, tr with people and institutions in the networks that I, that I work with. And so it was interesting to see after he made that comment, he had a blog two months later and he kind of just, he changed it. And I like what it says here. It says it shifts some of the trust. 
So there's, there's cryptographic elements within a blockchain network that are absolutely key, but the issues that you're gonna be dealing with as you deploy blockchain networks are gonna be more, um, the issues will be more on the people, governance, and institution area. So, I don't have to go over this too much, because you, you we're hearing stories about what makes, you know, what use cases make blockchain more novel, okay? And part of it is source of truth, okay? We don't have sources of truth per se on the internet like blockchain can offer. So disputed claims against diamonds, that was a presentation in a keynote speech last, uh, last conference, it was fascinating. Even in a war-torn country, you can have absolute source of truth of where the providence of diamonds came. You know, and so there's aspects of that. If you're looking to try to penetrate uh, a novel use case that will perpetuate your acceptance of your blockchain, look at these areas, because these are the areas that are taking a leadership take, okay? We talked about supply chain, you know, but all of this stuff, as I look at it, it's not guaranteed. It's garbage in, garbage out, okay? And there's potential completeness issues. How do I know that everything, you know, all the supply chain is going to be put in? So this by itself doesn't work. It has to be worked and it has to meet certain standards in order to, for it to be effective and trustworthy. Now, the reason why I got involved so much in the blockchain area is the last two areas, the self-sovereign identity and the verifiable credentials. We've been dealing with the user ID and password issue for many, for years, for as long as I, you know, as long as we can all remember, and the federation doesn't work. So I deal with, oop. So the federal government and, and commercial entities that work with the federal government standard called PIVI, they issue credentials. Okay, so I have a credential, I can sign anything, really sign a document, it's good, and people can recognize it, but I can't, I can't perpetuate, I can't federate my, my application too well. It has, to be, it has to be assigned and developed. I've been working with commercial uh, defense contractors that work with a hundred different ad projects on the Department of Defense, okay, and it takes forever to actually get these things deployed. And then, so we have, a, we have a duplication problem. I mean, it just doesn't work. And it can't, it can't scale. And so this is an avenue where it could scale. Now, the challenge is, you know, for self-sovereign identity and verifiable credentials, you know, we're taking digital credentials away from the wallet and using it, it's going to take a massive effort. The same kind of effort that it took for the internet. And that's another takeaway for this. So, from a verifiable credential standpoint, this is very similar to what I deal with, okay? So we have issuers, and I audit the issuers. They issue your credential based on certain standards. You gotta give certain level of criteria, your, your passport or whatever that would prove that you are who you say you are, enough to the point where the issuer will give you a credential. And now you're relaying, relying on the credential of the issuer or the reputation of the issuer. Okay, if it's your, you know, if it's, if it's your gym membership company, you know, it wouldn't be of, of value for, you know, transferring money in a bank. So you have to look at the context of issuers. But at, at some point, I, I am based on, all, I, my identity is dependent on, on credentials that have been issued to me, and that creates that that identity that I can then present to verifiers who care about that. So if I wanna go past the TSA line, they're gonna look for certain credentials I have in my digital wallet, okay? And they don't have to know that the credential that was issued by the state of Washington, you know, they don't have to look at that. They just have to know that it has been created and it's in my digital wallet and they can be able to prove that using the technology that is being built today. So in essence, I, I, with the technology, I'm able to write my decentralized ID. The issue will create that. I have a public key and it's available, okay? It's available because I have redundancy of the network and I can, you know, 
So in, I don't have to worry if I'm going to the TSA, is the network going to be available? It should be available, and it has to be, and if, it, if it's gonna be viable for these activities. <coughs> so the issuer will sign my digital credential and it'll be put it into my digital wallet, and then I can offer that as proof. The verifier will read the fact that that public key is mine, and they'll be able to prove and verify I am, at least I, that, that the credential that was issued is actually meeting the standard that they require, okay? They require a certain list of digital credentials and you have to follow those, that governance framework that exists. So there's no integration needed between the issuer and the, valid, and, and the verifier. How did I say it, Drummond, right? This is, there you go. I said it in my own, my own way on that. So if you look, now we're looking at the communication protocols around a blockchain network. Now, if you're thinking that it's only these lower levels, these are the cryptographic layers, okay? This is where, you know, at the lowest level for a, you know, a network that's dealing with self-sovereign identity, we're dealing with data that's sitting on public ledgers, distributed le ledgers, and also the communication program protocols that appear on wallets and your on smartphones, okay? And a lot of those are driven, they're still needed to have governance frameworks driving it. Who's allowed to be a steward? Who can be a node? You know, there's protocols as we're working with the sovereign network, you know, they wanna qualify, not everybody can be a steward, okay? You need to have certain, you know, your organization, you know, hadn't been sued or, you know, been brought to trial by a, jur by a jurisdiction. It has to be a going concern for a certain time. There needs to be confidence that you'll, that you'll hold your end of the bargain, you know, within the aspect of just being a steward, okay? Because you, you know, as a steward, you're holding up the reputation of the entire network. So there are protocols associated at the lowest level. And then here we're dealing with transactions on a public network. Who's going to do it? You know, who's going to have the rights to do that? How is it going to be done? Okay, all of those things need to be identified within the framework that's driving a blockchain network at the lowest layer. Now, at a, at a smartphone layer, it's going to be dealing with more of the typical things that you see in software developers, okay? Do you have a good protocol in order to build that? Do you have a change management methodology that works to allow for trustworthy uh, operations at, at, this, at this layer? And are you a bona fide agent of the governance authority to take these, these transactions and actions, okay? At this layer, we're dealing more with human trust, okay? So if you want to be an issuer or a verifier within, with, within this network, you're going to have to follow through on protocols, trust criteria that you will potentially be accountable. At least you'll assert to the marketplace that you are, that you are doing what you are being asked to do. And they could bring in a third party to attest to that. And I'm, that's the role that I play, I attest based on evidence that I see from, from institutions that provide me with their evidence to support their assertion that they're meeting trust criteria, okay? And at the top layer, someone's gonna have to decide the rules of the road. So in governance frameworks, there are their industry governance frameworks, you know, such as the you know, payment industry, there's industry um, focuses like the credit union industry, setting standards of, you know, when we issue a credential, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna meet KYC requirements? And how are we going to be accountable around that? And the key thing is, if I issue a credential to you as a participant, what purpose, what, is the, what can you do with that? What evidence do I provide you to get that credential, okay, that would allow you to do a certain transaction, okay? So they need to be matched up. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to issue, you want to have a governance authority issuing credentials from a, a non-reputable issuer that doesn't look at any, any, any evidence. They'll just throw you credentials 
without looking at are you, are you who you say you are, and then you can use that transaction to, to do bank transfers. So you need to have a matching of the issuance of a credential. That credential has to have a certain strength when you issue it, because that strength needs to be matched out with the actions that you can take with that credential. So as you add blockchain, you can add the blockchain credential registry to this trust framework. So I, as an auditor, I can, I can put credentials on, on the blockchain saying that, yes, it was me. Scott Perry actually issued you know, a report to, a, to an entity. And, and there's evidence associated with it. And there's a trust anchor that can issue credentials. And it can be backed up on the, on, on the credential registry. And we're seeing a lot of that with great work. Hopefully, you've had a chance to talk to John Jordan and some of the folks in the BC government, because they've created a fantastic credential re registry for business licenses in that territory. And so it adds value to a trust model based on that. So as I look, and in, in from my vantage point, uh, looking at kind of the trust model uh, within blockchain, I look at it in kind of four layers. You know, you got to have a chart, you know, you got to have a triangle in any presentation, you know that. And so two, I look at it as from a system centric and a human centric. Okay, so there's, there's aspects within the ledger and then you got to talk about data user and then the governance model. So I'm going to go quickly through and then we'll have a chance for any questions that you guys have. So at the ledger layer, these are the issues actually in the, you know, as I was working with the Sovereign Foundation, these are the issues that they've been dealing with. And these have actually been uh, architected in the Sovereign Governance Model, and I encourage all of you to go check that out. Because I think this is, this is state-of-the-art work. I mean, there wasn't any precedence for all this. And we moved forward and we looked at, well, what are the requirements at, at a blockchain ledger layer that needs to be, what policies, procedures, and requirements need to be built in. So the, whoever is gonna participate, you gotta have some criteria around it because most of these will be permissioned, not permissionless. You have to be part of a network and you have to, you know, you have to bring certain things to the table. You know, a credence, an ongoing, you know, an, you wanna be an ongoing uh, entity you want to have a certain amount of compute power. You need to have network availability in order to participate in this network. And yet, I don't think that, that the sovereign network is going to allow my friend Fred Furrier in Tanzania, Africa, to be a core uh, steward, to, you know, to anchor the validation, uh, you know, to be a validator node. Maybe it'll just be an observer node based on the aspects of what he can bring to the table, the accountability that he can actually afford to bring. And so these are the aspects, you know, these rules of the roads need to be identified. When do we actually establish that we need to have a fork? Okay, they better be thought of prior to an event happening. And I deal with, with that in the networks that I currently work with. So on a data management layer, these are some of the issues that we're dealing with as well. Who gets to read? Who gets to write? Is there anybody, you know, who doesn't know what a tombstone is? I didn't know what a tombstone was. And a tombstone, so you think that everything is immutable on the, uh, on the blockchain. Well, it is. You can't touch a tombstone, but maybe you could, a tombstone would be kind of like a, a, an air, an, a piece of data that kind of gets away from the active uh, access. You tombstone something. It's, it's on there, but it's kind of, it's identified for, for non-availability. Non Is that a fair statement to those that know better? Okay, good. And so we need to define smart contracts. You know, how are we going to deal with all that? And Sovereign has just put out a new token. We need rules of the road. How are we going to you know, how are we going to issue tokens? How are we going to monetize transactions? All of these things need to be identified in a layer of governance, policies, procedures, and such. The other thing is user match. Who's going to touch the, who's going to touch the blockchain? Who's going to administer it? Who's going to allow for that? Okay. 
and provisioning. How are we going to bring in new entities, new nodes into the network? You need to have rules of the roads of how that's going to happen. And it's absolutely key, you know, because it's still a user-generated network. And at the top layer, these are the types of things that need, that need to be identified. At a, at a risk assessment and management layer, what's the use case? What can go wrong within your application? Okay, and so what level of strength and, and accountability do you need that would match the use case that you're trying to deliver? And so that's an, a risk assessment and a risk management is absolutely key to, to require in any governance structure of a blockchain. And so we talked, you know, before we, had, we talked about the trust criteria. What are you going to hold all of your participants accountable? What policies, procedures, what control principles do they need? And okay, if we're going to introduce new policies and procedures, how are we going to do that? You know, how are we going to allow change to the network? We need to have some kind of voting protocol to allow for those things to happen. And are we going to add trusted third parties into the accountability of the network? And, uh, and obviously, if there's, there's, you get the, you know, there was a conversation about bringing all the lawyers in. They're the first ones that come in, okay? They want to make sure that all of their aspects are being represented. So, so that usually is part of your governance layer. So, as, so 25 years ago, I gave a presentation to 200 cybersecurity professionals. And at the time, uh, I was you know, leading the effort for Deloitte and Touche in, uh, in e-commerce security. It was brand new that we just created. It was an offering we created. And I gave a presentation. And at the time, you only had FTD flowers. That was the first e-commerce you know, e app you know, e application that was out in the marketplace. There was another one that went to, a, I was at a conference, and they were just starting in their, uh, in, in their offering, and that was Amazon, and they were just selling books. And I made, in the presentation, I said, we're gonna have multi-billion dollars in e-commerce e transactions, okay? And you're looking at me and says, oh yeah, yeah, we do that. But then that was, that was a joke. People couldn't even understand that, couldn't realize that. And I see that re history is repeating itself on a number of different fronts. If you look at, if you're old enough, like I am, I'm older than dirt here. So, you know, there's, there is parallels between what's happened 25 years ago to what I think is happening now. I see it, okay? And the parallels around, you see some of the emerging players. Do you remember the, you know, America Online and CompuServe, Earthling, and Prodigy? I had to look that up. Remember Prodigy? And so you're seeing some of the major players, they're taking a, they're, they're taking a, a foothold to get, you know, to move forward on standards. Sovereign, Corda, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the ones that you see the names. Are they going to survive? I don't know. You know, they could. They could be the MySpace or they could be the Facebook. You know, you, you know in the networks where you're going to have to have a leader. Someone's going to have to take a lead. And these organizations are doing that. But one thing that was key in the internet that propelled the internet to move forward was the communication innovator. When you put communication to the internet in every home, that changed, that was the game changer, okay? That allowed, you know, you almost ubiquitous. Everyone had a, you had a great demand on that. It wasn't just the, the institutions, it was people. You know, and they all had individual needs, and there was profit margins for people that could capitalize on that. And in this case, uh, you know, I live in Seattle, and I'm dealing with people from T-Mobile that are saying maybe 5G is not going to be as exciting. But I'll tell you, that's where the activity is going to be on the smartphone. The smartphone is going to be the browser in the blockchain of the future. Everyone's working on my. I mean, I. You know, what millennial doesn't sit all their time and use that as your primary device? That is the primary device to drive activity, and that's going to be the eyes into the blockchain networks, okay? And so, as you look at the communication protocol, we haven't changed the communication protocol of TCP IP in 25 years. And there's no security payload on that. 
okay? And that's a problem. So we can get messages. We can, it's easy to get messages all around. It works beautifully, but it's not trusted. It's not trusted. In blockchain with verifiable credentials and self-sovereign identity can create a trusted payload within the stack. And that could make a difference because there are innovative applications that are ready to be built on the internet if, if, if identity could be trusted. And that's the key factor. So I've been waiting for that. It's building itself. It's moving in, in, a, in a proper direction. But that could be the game changer moving forward to the future. So that's all I had. I think we had you know, probably a, couple, a minute or two if you had any questions or you can come. I'll be here all day tomorrow. You can have a whole conversation about trust. I really appreciate you attending my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>